Welcome to the June Ask Us Anything. Uh, you have Alan, Scott, and myself on the call today. We're going to be diving into some of your submitted questions and then opening it up at the end uh, for live questions, as we usually do. All right, uh, this first one is for Scott. It's how to adjust macros and calories when recovering from an injury. Yeah, I think, look, one of the, and this probably relates to the second question, so we can cover both of these in the same time. Um, I think the thing about rehabilitation nutrition and sports nutrition, they are very similar, I guess, with the, priority for rehabilitation nutrition being maintenance or ensuring that there's not a loss of lean muscle mass and certainly that there's no malnutrition occurring um which you know you're just shifting the priority i guess a little bit towards more around that muscle mass for um recovering from injury in terms of losing weight or can you lose fat whilst recovering from an injury simultaneously i guess you need to define a few things here. And probably the first is when did the injury occur? Because in that acute phase, you certainly don't want to be reducing total calorie intake. Uh, your body is trying to recover. It is trying to heal. Your metabolic rate will actually increase during the acute phase of an injury. So the last thing you want to be doing is putting yourself in a caloric restriction or a caloric deficit um, with the sort of thought process of I don't want to get fat. So first and foremost, in the acute phase, you want to have ensure that total calorie intake is probably in a surplus uh, or definitely in a surplus in order to meet the nutritional requirements. Now, in terms of macronutrient split, certainly high protein intake is recommended and supported by the science. Um, the exact amount does differ but you certainly would be aiming for, a, look, as an absolute minimum, probably 1.8 grams, but certainly we would be pushing sort of over two grams uh, per kilo of body weight. Um, two to 2.5 grams has been found in the research to be, um, to be a fit, uh, an, an uh, amount that has certainly been shown to at least reduce the catabolic sort of effect of an injury and sort of... Um, when you're stationary or not able to do as much as possible. Now, in terms of protein and carbohydrate intake, you certainly want to ensure that the two of those macronutrients are consumed following uh, any exercise or any rehabilitation exercise to maximize uh, protein synthesis. In terms of fat, you probably want to just keep it at a moderate amount, so somewhere around that 0.9 to one gram per kilo of body weight. And again, that's going to depend on what your rehabilitation program is, the amount of hours you're training um, and where you're currently coming in. So as you shift from that acute phase into that sort of, um, I guess, remodeling phase of the injury and you're, you're following a good structured rehabilitation program, that's when total calories can be adjusted so that you ensure that you're meeting your requirements from a daily energy intake, but also trying not to ultimately put on too much body fat or body mass. Now, again, the focus in my opinion should still be on reducing lean muscle mass loss with the goal of rehabilitating the entire athlete. So you're not just focused on the injury, you're still maintaining um, a good amount of cardiovascular fitness and certainly looking at the entire body when you're doing it. Scott, for those that don't know, what is the acute phase and the remodeling phase or like how long are those? I can see people asking that. Yeah, I mean, you've got that that really, you know, that sort of first 48 hours where it's, um, you know, probably the inflammatory phase, I guess you're talking about. And you've got to you've got to manage that appropriately. And you're going to be, you know, I guess that's the, the, the super acute, if you want to talk about it that way, where you're going to get a lot of swelling, probably a lot of pain in that, and then it will start to settle down. Then you come into, I guess, that subacute phase, um, which can go, um, you know, again, it's not exactly like, it's a bit like uh, the shift in fat oxidation to carbohydrate oxidation. It doesn't occur at a certain point in time. Um, you know, you could be up to two weeks, 
you know, and you're going to get that graded shift after two weeks, two to four weeks. Certainly from four weeks onwards, you're looking at that remodeling phase um, where the body is starting to lay down um, a lot of, uh, well, whether you call it scar tissue or not, collagen, uh, muscle repair, and those sorts of things. So, you know, from that two to four week period, you're then moving into that phase. And then beyond that, the body is just uh, in a state where through rehabilitation, through exercise, whether that be strength training, cardiovascular training and whatnot, the body is going to be adapting for a very long time beyond that. And that's why it's important to, you know, when you are injured, don't just think, oh, okay, I, I just do whatever it is now. It's actually really important to keep protein high, keep your carbohydrates. You know, the timing of those carbohydrates is going to be really important, especially following training um, to maximize protein synthesis and whatnot. So um, I think we do see a lot of athletes when they are injured, suddenly think, oh, I don't need to focus on my nutrition, but I'd probably counter that and say that it's probably just as important or even more important at that point in time so that you don't lose that lean muscle mass and, uh, you know, decondition. Yeah. And then, sorry, one last follow-up question. Is, it a, is there a difference amongst injuries? Like if someone, let's say, is having knee surgery versus someone that was in a bike crash, perhaps? Um. I guess it, you know, if it's a, if it's a, an injury to the knee, whether it's caused by a bike crash or, you know, it's a long-standing meniscal injury and you've had arthroscopic surgery, it's still, I mean, the degree of the trauma is going to influence probably the recovery. But I mean, in terms of the way in which the body is going to respond to that, those phases are still going to be fairly, you know, they may be elongated depending again on the, the severity of the injury. Um, but and the total time for recovery is probably going to change based on the severity of the injury. But you're still thinking along the same lines in terms of you know how do I reduce the how do I reduce lean muscle mass uh, loss? How do I maintain quality amounts of energy in the body to allow me to rehabilitate properly? And how do I minimize you know putting on a lot of excessive body fat while still maintaining that primary focus of not losing you know muscle mass as you go now, obviously you've got things like joint range of motion proprioception all those other things which is going to be taken into account through the rehabilitation program but certainly from um you know the nutrition standpoint again focusing on not losing muscle mass and making sure that malnutrition doesn't occur so that's taking in you know, good quality sources of protein, obviously the timing of protein, carbohydrates, and then looking at the quality of the diet uh, in terms of, you know, high intake of fruit and vegetables, making sure all the micronutrients are taken into account. If supplementation is required for certain deficiencies, then that could be considered as well. Awesome. Thank you. I think that I've seen a lot of athletes kind of question it and to know like, yes, nutrition always needs to be, be a priority and potentially more so um, during an injury, especially in that acute phase. Yeah. I mean, the, the one thing that I would say where I think a lot of people get it wrong is they, they might injure their knee and think, oh, I can't do anything. And one thing we used to always say in professional sport is you treat the athlete, you don't treat the injury per se. So yes, the injury is being treated on, but at the same time, you can do a lot of work. If upper body is not affected, then certainly you can be doing that. If uh, you can do single leg cycling, if one knee, you just pop your knee up and do single leg cycling. Um, there's all possibilities you can do. You can look at blood flow restriction training, which, you know, you only suddenly need 30% of the load. Um, things like that can be you've got to be thinking outside the box and your trainer, your physiotherapist, whoever you're working with should be thinking outside the box to say, how can I keep this athlete's, um, you know, current level of fitness as high as possible, accepting that there are going to be some drops, but hopefully not too much by actually still treating the athlete as an athlete and not focusing just solely on, you know, the injured knee or the injured ankle or whatever it is that's occurred. Yeah. I, I can attest to that. When I broke my ankle multiple times, I was in the pool with a pool buoy, <laughs> swimming, yeah. like doing whatever it was or doing seated strength training stuff. And so, yep. Yeah. 
and and then the only other thing I'd say is like depending on the injury, you know, if if it is a yeah, you know, if it's a tendon injury, then could you be using specifics like collagen, um, you know, to potentially pre you know you take that in before loading. I'd probably argue that taking in some collagen before any joint injury or any tendon injury is probably, you know, there's certainly no harm in doing that. So I'd be thinking that. I don't think there's any, and Alan, you can chime in certainly. I don't think there's any specific nutrition specific to an injury that you wouldn't probably put across all injuries. I'm trying to think. Obviously, collagen's one that's, you know, talked about with tendon injuries, but I'd certainly probably still recommend taking that at that for any type of joint injury or muscle injury as well, as long as, along with, you know, other good high quality protein, uh, because obviously the amino acid profile of, of collagen versus say a whey protein or a plant protein is, is a little bit different. Yeah. Scott, anything, Alan, from that? Do you, anything, do you think anything like specific? I can't think of anything. It's more, you know, no, it's the, prin no, the no. principles, it isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was going to say what you did before. Like, it, it's probably more about the type of injury and what training you can continue. You know, yeah. I, was, I was talking to someone the other night about, you know, Matt Heyman when he won Perry Roubaix back in 2016. Like, he actually crashed and broke, I think it was his collarbone or his wrist about six weeks prior. But he was training on the, the kicker that whole time through. And he had his arm in a cast, like propped up on a ladder while he was training. And obviously, yeah. you know, he's a professional. So he's going to push through more than, more than most of us. Um, but he came, you know, he came out of that flying. But again, you know, we don't assume necessarily just because you're injured means you aren't training at all, or you, you know, you're necessarily training a lot less. Sometimes you can continue training depending on what the injury is and what training you can do. So that'll still drive, <clears throat> sorry, a need for carbohydrate potentially. Yeah, no, it, it's so it's so interesting, isn't it? As soon as someone's injured, and I've seen this on fuel in. It's like, oh, I've got an injury, I need to stop my program and i'm sort of like i don't want to argue the point but i'm like well you can still train <laughs> you can still train and you should still be focused on nutrition and now's probably just the best time to be doing that so you know mm -hmm. if any of you are injured i would maybe think about you know how you are doing your nutrition and um you know don't let yourself get completely deconditioned just because you do have an injury there's there's always options what you can do um mm -hmm. and it will certainly help you psychologically if you don't you know, you get an injury and yes, it, it's bad for a week or so and you'll probably be down in the dumps. But then once you start getting back on the bike or in the pool or, you know, Alter-G, whatever it is that you can use to get you going, a rowing machine, whatever, then, um, you know, it certainly helps. And to that point, I think, you know, you know, you can throw as much protein and creatine at, at your body as you want, but if you're not doing any physical activity, you're not stimulating the muscle, you're still going to get, loss of muscle mass probably i mean less but you'll still get some loss of muscle mass along the way yeah it's uh it's that thing isn't it it's like nutrition is great but don't think of it as like it's like high carbohydrate intake it's like yes okay high carbohydrate intake has been shown to be advantageous but you still need to do the training in order to benefit from that and so i think that the only thing i would say on that alan which is fascinating and i don't know if you've had much experience with blood flow restriction but it is actually incredible that you can offset um, you know, muscle atrophy just by restricting the muscles for you know, 15, 20 minutes a day and, ab and doing absolutely nothing, even when they're in bed rest. Um, and it, it's pretty amazing that. So, But obviously do it under supervision. Don't go and just uh, tourniquet your leg or anything like that. We're not advocating that. There is certain protocols. And uh, you can actually Google the AIS, has a, the Australian Institute of Sport has a wonderful PDF on blood flow restriction training and how to use it. Um, it's actually free on the web. So people could do that. Very Have you had much experience with that, Alan, with um, blood flow restriction? No. Yeah, we used it a lot at the uh, the Maple Leafs. They had these pretty cool machines, actually, which uh, we, we never had the the advantage of having those necessary. We've used blood pressure, blood pressure cuffs previously when I was at Oracle, but these were actual pneumatic machines that, you know, had specific pressures that allowed for limb occlusion and whatnot but um yeah very very interesting and very effective so certainly something to look at if you are um incapacitated okay we'll move on all right so this one is for alan it's there there's been a shift in endurance fueling 
from carbs with some protein, like Hammer's Perpetuum, to higher carbohydrate offerings like Morton or Scratch Lab Superfuel. Can you talk about the pros and cons of both approaches? Mm. Yes, certainly. Um, and apologies, my voice is a bit sketchy today. I've got a bit of a cold. Um, but if we look at why these higher carbohydrate offerings have come about, it's, it's probably about 15 years ago when it was realized that the addition of fructose to glucose as a combination of different carbohydrate types within, whether it's drinks or gels or anything else, can improve the the total amount of carbohydrate you can actually absorb from the gut and, and per minute or per hour of exercise and therefore contribute. So I guess prior to that, the recommendations had always been around sort of 30 up to 60 grams an hour of carbohydrate. And that was kind of considered the ceiling up until sort of the mid 2000s. Uh, and then all of a sudden we were looking at values of sort of 90 grams an hour um, and probably more recently been, that's been taken even further in some cases, particularly um, professional cycling, for example, up to maybe 100 grams plus an hour. Uh, and even in ultra running now, some of the, the ultra trail Mont Blanc guys have been pushing those kind of values even in ultra trail running, which is which is pretty incredible. Um, and so I guess the protein containing products came from an era maybe where carbohydrate intakes weren't or the recommendations weren't at that level. And when carbohydrate is sort of well, inadequate for lack of a better word, but when there's a lower carbohydrate intake, there seems to be a benefit from protein. But once you hit a certain amount of carbohydrate, probably around that 60 grams an hour or above, there doesn't seem to be any additional benefit of adding protein for most events. Now that might be different when you're talking about your really ultra endurance, you know, 15, 20 hours plus of continuous exercise, but that's a, a different story. So I think pros and cons of both, I guess the pros of the higher carbohydrate offerings, your Morton's, your super fuel or SIS beta fuel are probably the, the three main ones on the market. I guess where this sort of came from is that people were originally doing a lot of this with gels. So you would have your six to 8% carbohydrate mix because the industry said that's what you had to have. And if you had more than that, you'd get gut issues and you couldn't possibly have a carbohydrate mix that was more concentrated than that. And so people would drink that and that would only give them maybe 30 or 40 grams an hour. And if they wanted to get to 90, they had to add gels on top of that. But over time, people realized, well, hang on a minute, it's all getting mixed in the stomach anyway. So this 6 to 8% is absolute rubbish because by the time you have your 6 to 8% drink and then you've added in a couple of gels and you churn it up in your stomach, what's in there is actually probably more like 20% anyway. And so these products came about because they allow you then to get most of that from the drink without having to consume extra solid foods or gels and things like that to get to that kind of 90 grams an hour. So um, Morton was probably the first one to do that. They argue that their hydrogel is, is super special. I argue in most cases, it's probably not. Um, and then you've got Perpetuum, oh, sorry, Scratch Super Fuel and obviously the SIS Beta Fuel, which don't have that hydrogel, but still have that high level of carbs. So they're typically sort of 15 to 16% carbs. So it basically just allows you to get more carbs in for the same amount of fluid. Um, and I guess the other thing there is because these are designed to be consumed at 15 to 16% carbs, they can adjust the flavor appropriately. Because if you just take a, like a standard Gatorade powder or something that's designed to be mixed at 6 to 8% or tailwind or whatever, and then you make it up as a 15% mix, the flavor is just going to be so intense because it's not designed to be made at that concentration. And so these products are designed to be made there. So they've adjusted the flavor down and the carbohydrate up. So I guess that's the the pros of it as, as opposed to, um, you know, trying to make that mix, which you could do with another product. It would probably just taste pretty horrible. Um, the protein side of things, yeah, really the, the main advantage um, was seen at that time was around, I guess, compensating for a relative lack of carbohydrate in what people were consuming. Um, I'd say there's probably no other real advantage of it unless you get into the ultra endurance stuff. And even then, a lot of those advantages are kind of a bit speculative. They're sort of perceived advantages rather than uh, well-researched advantages. And part of the reason is it's just so difficult to do research in that duration of exercise to come up with strong conclusions. But that's probably the main ones. Um, and we'll probably come back to this point. I think on the next slide, we've got a question about adding maltodextrin to drinks, which kind of fits with that flavor versus carbs, which we'll come back to shortly. Great, thank you. I think that your point, Alan, about the flavor 
flavoring of the, like trying to make your own versus this super fuel or Morton or whatever is a really good point that we don't always think about um, of just how like the taste, it, all the work is already done in these super fuel products, yeah. I guess. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right, so this next one is for me. Uh, it says, are your services for beginner intermediate athletes? I know I want and need help with nutrition for performance, but I'm unsure if it's too advanced for me. So I wanna say the beauty of the fueling program itself is the simplicity of it, is the fact that it takes, it does all of the work for you so that nutrition can be as complicated or simple as you need for it to be. Uh, all athletes, whether you're a beginner or an intermediate athlete, you have the same nutritional needs. Just because you're a professional doesn't mean all of a sudden your body has, you know, like it, it need, like it needs the fancy gas from the fancy car. We all need the same macro and micronutrients. And especially, you know, the, whatever training we are doing is hard for our individual body. And we need to recover and perform the exact same way that intermediate and advanced athletes do. So nutrition is for everyone. The app is for everyone. And in terms of making it um, if it's too advanced, the nice component there is it's aligned with your training. So whatever your training is, the nutrition component follows along with that. And then looking at it, you can either go by the macronutrients, uh, you can look and insert recipes, you can use the hand model. The idea is understanding your nutritional needs and that basic understanding will just help you um, in your day-to-day -day life. And I think adding in the other elements of the app, the carbohydrate testing, the sweat testing, necessary and important for beginners as well as intermediate and advanced athletes. It's something that we should all know and that will help you feel better and perform better and recover better um, as an athlete. Yeah, thanks. So I think the only thing I would add to that is, you know, it's all about habit formation. And that's really what you know, the, the color coding is designed to do is get you in the habit of recognizing when you need lower amounts of carbohydrates, moderate amounts of carbohydrates and higher amounts of carbohydrates. Now that's going to vary. Those colors are obviously going to vary based on your training program. If you've got a lot of training, you're probably going to see a lot of green because the volume is there and the intensity. If you're starting off and you've got lower intensity sort of workouts, and you've got, you know, potentially goals of improving body composition and that you may see lower amounts of carbs um, and more red. But the whole process there is about building in the habits to get appropriate nutrition for you. And I think the only thing we don't do for you is actually get you to eat the food. And I think that really does come down to the athlete. And that's the effort on the athlete's part to follow the program and much like swimming, biking, running. Effort is required and effort's required to be, you know, planning ahead, making sure you've got the available food in your, in your house, getting rid of the foods that might be sabotaging your, your program and just being very thorough, but very patient with it. It's, it's not a quick fix as well. Um, it's not about suddenly losing, you know, all your weight or having huge improvements in the first week. It's, it's a graded process and something that you follow, you're diligent with adherence and consistency are probably two of the words that we like to use the most because that's ultimately what's going to get you results. Perfect. All right. So this next one, we're back to Alan. Is it okay to add multidextrin powder to my drink to increase the carb amount while exercising? If yes, are there any considerations that I need to take into account when using multidextrin? Yes, very good question, Thomas. Yes, definitely. I would suggest you could add maltodextrin powder to your drinks. I guess the real advantage of maltodextrin for those not familiar with it is it's basically, it's like a glucose, but it's it's a glucose polymer. But basically what that means is lots of glucose molecules joined together in a chain. But the fact that they're joined together in a chain means that they don't have the sweetness that you would get from pure glucose or sugar or something like that. So maltodextrin powder doesn't really have any flavor to it. It doesn't taste particularly sweet. It doesn't really taste like anything. Um, so the real beauty of it is you can add it to products without changing the flavor or the sweetness profile of the product at all. 
So I was just talking before about, you know, those higher carb drinks. Um, you know, most of them are made largely based on maltodextrin as the glucose source. And then they add fructose to that because if they tried to get a 15% drink from, you know, pure glucose um, or sucrose, which is half glucose, half fructose, it would just taste terrifically sweet. And so maltodextrin powder is sort of the backbone of most of those higher carb sports drinks and gels. So yeah, absolutely, you can add it. And it's a really good way of boosting up the carb content without changing the flavor or the sweetness of a drink. I guess the one thing we do need to consider here is, as I came back to before, you know, you're your gut can absorb about 60-ish grams an hour of glucose. Some people, it's probably a little bit more. Some people, maybe slightly less. Um, beyond that, you can absorb more carbohydrate, but it has to come from fructose. And the reason for that is there's two different um, transporters that sit in the wall of your gut that actually bring that carbohydrate in you know, out of the gut and into the blood. And the one that does it for glucose tends to max out at about 60 grams an hour during exercise, um, whereas the fructose one, you can get in addition to that. So essentially in the old days, they used to say, you know, 90 grams an hour, two to one glucose fructose ratio. Well, it turns out that's just a convenient ratio. It's got nothing to do with the ratio. It's just, if you're doing that, the first 60 grams was glucose and then the, the last 30 grams was fructose. But essentially what you're looking at is a maximum of 60 grams an hour from glucose, which includes maltodextrin. And then any additional carbohydrate above 60 grams an hour needs to come from a source of fructose. And so I guess the only potential caveat with the maltodextrin is you need to be careful that when you add that to the product, if it's already fairly glucose heavy, you're not suddenly having 70, 80, 90 grams an hour of glucose-based carbohydrates, which is likely to give you a lot of gut issues. And I saw this the other day, actually, with an athlete who didn't realize they were using rice malt syrup of all things, which is, again, pure glucose when it's digested. And they were they were getting uh, they they obviously didn't work out what they were doing they were getting like 140 grams an hour of pure glucose and wondering oh. why they're having major gastrointestinal issues during and after exercise um, not surprising to me when when they told me what they were doing um, so yes you can use maltodextrin but that would be the caveat around it is yeah you kind of top out your glucose absorption at 60 grams an hour. So, Alan, that's oh sorry, can I just show me? And that's a great point though. It's something we discussed, isn't it? But but it came from rice. The the mm. it's different sugar, isn't it? Mm. Like, you so, know, it's it, it what we're joking about here is, you know, glucose is glucose, guys. Mm. Whether it comes from, you know, whether it be organic or whether it be rice or whether it be, you know, a starch at the end of the day, if that's breaking down into glucose, that's glucose and that needs to be paid attention to and i think what alan is hinting out there is be aware of what you're consuming mm. because it it might be that you you the intentions are there and you think you're doing it right but actually you're taking in as what did you say 140 grams of glucose and you yeah. wonder why you got gi issues like that's going to mm. do it for you yeah exactly right and i mean fructose in itself is incredibly sweet so generally anything that's savory, you know, bread, pasta, rice, all those sorts of carbohydrate sources, that's pretty much going to be all, you know, once the starch is digested down, it provides all glucose yes. molecules, no fructose. So if you want fructose, it has to come from either pure fructose, fructose in honey, which is about 50-50, I think. I can't remember the exact ratio off the top yeah. of my head. Or sucrose, plain table sugar, which is um, half glucose, half fructose or high fructose corn syrup, which is similar. So would it be safe to assume most athletes should just stick to the super fuel mixes that already have the higher concentrate? Like, should we play scientists? What do you, what do you think? Um, I, I do it with some athletes I work with, and sometimes it's more because they really can't stand the flavor of the drinks like even the super fuels and things like that so they really don't or like some of the ultra runners where they just get sick of really sweet things after hour 10 or 15 and so we want to give them something that has like a neutral flavor um and so that's when we use the maltodextrin sometimes with fructose which is basically what morton is it's just maltodextrin fructose and some of the hydrogel stuff um which doesn't have really much flavor at all uh, and so it's got a very neutral neutral flavor um the other time I use maltodextrin a lot, and I think we talked about it a few sessions ago, is actually 
uh, to help with carbohydrate intake outside of exercise. So particularly carbohydrate loading, when you're struggling to get in your six, seven, 800 grams of carbohydrate, depending on how much you need, um, adding just some maltodextrin in a bottle, you can add flavor to it or just have it plain if you don't want the sweetness. And you can just sip on that over the morning or over the afternoon. Um, and that's an easy way to get in an extra one, 200 grams of carbohydrate without much effort. So yeah, it can be used during exercise, but it can be used outside of exercise as well. Um, is there a brand that you like since you've worked with some, like, I just, I don't want someone just going on Amazon and grabbing something random. To- mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, maltodextrin is maltodextrin. Um, it's just a raw ingredient that's bought on the market. So yeah, I mean, I would, in Australia, there's a company called Bulk Nutrients that a lot of clients tend to use just because it's cheap and they have good, you know, they deliver really quickly. Um, but you can, yeah, you can buy it in health food stores um, or supplement type shops. Uh, you can buy it online from your your Wiggles and those kind of online sports nutrition stores. Um some people even buy it from homebrew shops because it is actually an ingredient in cheap home brewing as well. Um, and it's pretty much the same thing. So there are, even a lot of them will claim and kind of typical industry, I am maltodextrin is better than their maltodextrin because it's 17 glucose is long and theirs is 21. And that's a problem. The differences are so minor. I wouldn't worry about it, to be honest. Okay, great. Alan, is maltodextrin classified as a food? Is it a food grade? supplement is that where you classify it yeah so like in australia it is yeah because i had this discussion with an athlete actually we were talking about like you know do you need to get like you know nsf or informed sport like for something like this and it's like well then you go down like well every cereal now has protein in it and every bar and it's like well none of them are tested so like yeah, obviously it, it, the responsibility sits on the athlete. Whatever you take in mm-hmm. is your responsibility, despite whatever we might recommend. But where do we sit with things like, you know, like maltodextrin in my mind is sugar. <laughs> like I'm like, mm-hmm. well, you know, surely you could just buy that from anywhere. But I guess, yeah. you know, it, it is a tricky one, isn't it? Because you don't want yeah. to could have a inadvertent banned substance in it. But yeah, the, the, the risk from an anti-doping point of view, generally comes in when a product has been processed through a facility that also processes other supplements and or pharmaceuticals. Um, There's been a lot of work in Australia done was in the lead up to the Tokyo Olympics around the protein fortified foods that you just mentioned, Mm. Scott, because there was a concern from some sports is like, if my athlete takes a protein fortified granola bar, will they test positive because it's got whey protein added to it? Um, And what they basically found through that process is that when food manufacturers add protein to food to fortify it, that protein as a raw ingredient never leaves the food supply chain to go out into supplement land or pharmaceutical land. And so there was virtually no risk. But if you were to go and buy a protein smoothie at a cafe and they've just bought some random protein powder off the internet, and that's what they use as an ingredient in their protein smoothie that they're making in the cafe, that might actually introduce some risk there. Um, maltodextrin is a hard one because it's very difficult to know whether the raw ingredient maltodextrin that's made in the food industry for adding into food products has mm-hmm. actually left the food supply chain, gone out into supplement land and come back in the form of a product. Um, so it is, it is more difficult to kind of keep tabs on that. I know there is, it's hard to find in Australia, but I think in the US there's a brand called Now, I think it is. They have orange tubs from yeah. memory and they actually do have a, um, a batch tested maltodextrin you can buy. So oh, okay. it's harder to get here, but you can get it overseas. And therefore, like you mentioned about the home brewing, which I've actually, I've heard people doing that. Like, would you be better off buying maltodextrin from say a source that is actually more intended for something like home brewing because it's unlikely that it came from, as you say, supplement yeah, land? Possibly. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm. It's, it's an interesting one. It's always mm. a, a bit of a, yeah, as, a, as we always will say, though, it is ultimately, you know, for the athletes, it is your responsibility, whatever goes in, despite whatever we might recommend to you, which I know sounds like a cop out from our end. But unfortunately, that's the that's the law. And that's what happens if you do get a positive test and you're held up uh, in a yeah. um, a tribunal or something. And it will always come down to you putting it in your mouth, in your body. So, yeah. Something and for that think. reason, I've tended to use less maltodextrin with my elite and pro athletes than I have with recreational athletes. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. 
All right. So this next one is for me. I do, this is Richard asking, I do landscape installation, lifting, digging, carry, manual labor. How do I account for off the bike activity? Uh, I think this is a good question and somewhat multifaceted in that um, there's a kind of a couple things to take into account. Uh, so physical activity uh, is kind of secondary in terms of caloric burn to our like resting metabolic rate. That's 60 to 80% of kind of our daily caloric needs. Um, and then when you take this physical activity into account, uh, our like, and I'm not saying that Richard isn't, doesn't do a lot in his manual labor job, but studies have shown that we overestimate um, the amount of activity outside of sports that we do on a daily basis. So how much physical activity throughout his workday is he actually doing? In that case, I would suggest like wearing your Garmin or a tracking device of sorts to actually take a look because potentially there could be a greater caloric burn um, in based on the physical labor and physical activity of your job. However, if this isn't, if you've had this job for years and this isn't a new added in um, amount of physical activity, your body has adjusted to that daily caloric burn. So are you, are, if you're losing significant amounts of weight and you can't account for that, then yes, we would, you know, have to up and account for that uh, because you are, you know, burning more calories than we were expecting or than the normal sedentary athlete uh, your age. But for the most part, unless it becomes a problem that you're not, you're, you're not taking in enough calories, then there doesn't need to be that added accountability in terms of caloric intake in that. Does that sound yes. up to you? I actually, I ended up speaking, I think, to this athlete or another athlete who had exactly the same question. And I did exactly what you suggested when wearing a heart rate monitor. And he was concerned because he was losing weight. And I'm not sure if it was Richard or Daryl, but effectively he was expending actually a hell of a lot of energy. Um, so in terms of how you can account for it in fuel in, <clears throat> what I suggested was he put in that he's actually walking, um, put into his training peaks account that he's at a Z2 and actually walking for, you know, three or four hours and just put it in as that into the program. And what that actually did was adjust his calories and his total energy intake to a level where he now feels very comfortable um, and not hungry all the time. So I think your point, make it objective. <clears throat> where, where a heart rate monitor actually, um, you know, assess how much extra you're doing is it a very physical job or not and then if it is it's obviously going to be fairly low intensity but consistent put in a session like i suggested either you know two two hour blocks before breakfast after uh sorry before lunch after lunch and we can adjust the program accordingly and that that seems to have worked pretty well so it's an interesting scenario it's not something we obviously designed fuel in for specifically, but, you know, everyone has to do their work and uh, whatever that work is, hopefully we can account for that. Perfect. All right. Cool. So Daniel's question, I feel like we've had questions around uh, swimming and urine output and cold, like uh, before. So, hi, I have found that after swimming, especially in cold water, I produce a lot of urine due to immersion diuresis. The problem is critical in the Ironman distance because I have to urinate during the entire section of the bike. I don't know if this also affects the hydration criteria and guidelines, but I feel that I don't control the hydration I practice in training. Any advice, Alan, take it away. Mm. Yeah, this is a tricky one. Uh, what I might do is start off by explaining for those not aware what immersion diuresis actually means, and then we'll talk about the I guess the implications of that so immersion diuresis is a phenomenon that happens when you're immersed in water particularly cold water where basically all the blood vessels in your extremities so your hands feet arms and legs um, constrict and that forces more of your blood back to the core of your body what happens when you force more blood back to the core of your body is more blood is then flowing through your kidneys and the kidneys detect this in terms of volume and pressure and then they decide 
whether you, you know, it's one of the factors that decides you know, how well hydrated your kidneys think you are at any given time and therefore how much water they're going to produce into the urine. And so the idea here is with immersion diuresis, being in water does it to some degree. Being in a cold environment, whether it's in water or not, does it as well. Cold water, you get both of those things happening simultaneously. So you're getting a lot more blood through through the kidneys. As a result, your body gets tricked into thinking you're overhydrated and produces additional urine, basically. Um, and so then the issue is obviously when you get out of the water onto the bike, there's this urge to pee because you've got a full bladder. Um, yeah, I mean, you can't trick physiology, unfortunately. We all like to think we can, the, the biohackers of the world. But uh, generally speaking, we we try to trick the body and the body ends up tricking us. So, I mean, in this case, I guess the first thing I'd say is make sure that when you do start exercise, you've got as empty a bladder as you possibly can. Um, so you've got more room to to fill it. Um, and then when you do get onto the bike, yes, you, you may end up having a full bladder and needing to pee. Unfortunately, that's that's part of the sport. I guess if we want to try and retain as much of that fluid as best we can, particularly in that cool weather, um, I guess the first thing is to make sure our body temperature yeah, obviously we don't want it to go high, but we also don't want it to go too low either. And I've seen examples of triathletes, you know, get out onto the bike course and they're particularly some of the smaller female athletes literally shivering, you know, after, after coming out of the water on a cool morning because maybe they underestimated how cold it was going to be and, and didn't dress appropriately as well. So, you know, make sure you have got some, you know, coverage of, of arms and legs if it is a particularly cold day to try and again stimulate some of that blood flow back to the periphery rather than the core. I guess the other thing you could think about would be using, um, you know, sodium and electrolytes to to try and uh, again, you know, to uh, encourage the body to hang on to that fluid rather than peeing it out. So, you know, we might do this before exercise in certain scenarios. You know, this was done a lot in the Tokyo Olympics before the marathon, where we get people to load up on quite a lot of sodium alongside their fluid to actually retain that fluid so they didn't pee it out. And so again, that will make some difference here, but obviously you can't do that while you're swimming. And by then the damage is probably done in terms of having a full bladder afterwards, but it might, you know, help a little bit in, in preventing that becoming an ongoing issue rather than something that's just happening initially at the start. Um, in terms of the other side of things, I guess it's also making sure that you're not overhydrated, which is certainly possible to happen during the exercise. Um, not being sort of overly aggressive if you don't have to be on the bike with your hydration. Uh, and that's something we're going to talk about. That's actually next week's topic in the Q&A is around the, the what, where and how of hydration. So um, yeah, we can talk about that in a bit more detail maybe next week. Perfect. And thank you for the definition. That's probably the best definition I've heard on immersion diuresis ever. So really clear and helpful, I think, for the athletes. All right, last one. Uh, I This is Chris's question. I work 10 and a half hour days, door to door. My day is about 12 with kids, family, et cetera. I work out on my non-work days, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday, which means I do back to back. Um, on Thursdays, I swim for 90, shower, lift weights for 45, et cetera. What do you suggest for fuel? I usually eat breakfast, cottage cheese, and drink coffee before exercising. Question, do I eat during the transition and what do I eat? Uh, so I think probably a good question for anyone in that we all have, um, you know, we're all going from training to work to family um, and wondering how to fit in this time as, or at least on the weekends on some of the longer training sessions. Uh, and I guess the eating in transition in between. So if it's uh, a bike to run, uh, that's as we've always suggested with fuel and like fueling during the session. Um, and then afterwards having a big meal to help with recovery. Um, and I think her question on Sunday, two hours of running, it straight into a 45 minute weight class again fueling having something before and then fueling during your run and then that post either recovery shake um so that you don't need necessarily to fuel in between if you have time between the run and the and the weight class yes that could be helpful uh and i think her breakfast of cottage cheese 
I would hope there was something else with the cottage cheese. Uh, you know, the beauty of the fuel and app is we tell you, you know, should this be a low, moderate or high carbohydrate session? Uh, so if the run was intense, then yes, you would absolutely want cottage cheese and something else, uh, potentially higher carbohydrate. Um, and what do I eat? I think hopefully, I don't know if most athletes can do cottage cheese before, but tending to limit kind of the fiber and dairy to avoid any potential GI issues. So more of the bland carbohydrate foods, um, especially if you're, I think if she's doing like longer swims. Um, but in that transition, yes, between swim and lifting weights, there's definitely time in there to get in a gel, uh, maybe a recovery shake quick with some protein in it before lifting uh, could help. Right. Sorry, go back there. Sorry, can I ask you that? Sorry, I was on mute. So, I, I, Chris, I'd probably say, look, with your Thursday swimming for 90 minutes and then a shower and lifting weights, certainly, you know, that morning breakfast, I would imagine, is either going to be yellow or green. So you're probably getting in, you know, a couple of bits of toast. Whether you want to put some cottage cheese on that or not, I guess that's up to you. you certainly, you could look to include a banana. You could have a couple of eggs before that. Again, the timing of that before the swim, you probably want to allow, you know, ideally 60 minutes. But, you know, if you want to train the gut, it could be 15, 20 minutes before. Certainly 90 minutes swim, you should be consuming something during that swim. So to Alan's point, something like maltodextrin, if you don't want anything sweet, just have, you know, 40 to 60 grams in the bottle on the sideline on the edge of the pool. Um, transitioning out, if it's really quick, you know, again, you could have a couple of boiled eggs. You could have a banana there. You could have a ready-made peanut butter and jam wrap, just something very quickly to get in before going and lifting weights that does help you. Um, and then if you're doing uh, Saturday, again, two-hour ride, certainly you'd be expected to be eating a good breakfast. So overnight oats in the morning before that, maybe a piece of toast with that. Um, certainly two-hour ride, if, depending on the intensity, is either going to be red or green. You should be fueling appropriately during that. And uh, if you're doing the shorter brick, maybe the run off the bike is, is not requiring any fuel, but you should certainly be refueling as, as Elizabeth pointed out. Um, and again, I would imagine after that volume of training, you would be pushed either to a yellow or a green meal, um, depending on you know what the rest of the week and the day looks like. Um, so yeah, I think probably... For you, Chris, I'd be really focused on that, what you're getting in before the meal, before the sessions and how we're telling you to fuel during those sessions so that you have enough energy to do, you know, the follow-up sessions and not be completely depleted. Alan, do you have any any little suggestions, any tips or tricks? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I see this all the time with the Olympic and Paralympic guys because they might do three sessions before lunch most yep. days of the week. So they're constantly going from one session, short break, next session, short break, next session. Um, yeah, I guess two things that we would do with those guys, I guess the first one is, you know, exactly all the stuff you suggested, Scott, but I think the organization is critical here. Yeah. You know, those guys have had to learn to kind of pack a lunchbox, like they're going to school because they're, they're not going home between sessions. They're going from, you know, out on the bike, straight into the pool, straight into the gym kind of thing. Um, and so that it's just about being organized to have that stuff with you using convenient sources of carbohydrate that are small, easy, digestible easily digestible between the sessions and sometimes it's also they'll know that um yes technically my first session may not need that much fuel but because i've got these other sessions i'm actually going to overfuel that session slightly because it's actually contributing to the next session so it's almost like rather than looking at each section each individual session in isolation that you kind of mash them together and instead of looking at like a two hour ride, a one hour and a half hour swim, and then a one hour gym session, you're actually putting all of that together and going, oh, actually there's five hours of work here. And how would I fuel that if it was five hours of continuous work? Very different to what you would do for each of those sessions if it was just a one-off session on the day. And so they might deliberately yeah, overfuel for what you need in that session simply because you don't want to go in depleted into the next session, depending on what that session is, whether it matters or not. I think that, that's a great point, isn't it? Looking at, you know, that volume as an entity rather than separate. And 
I know a lot of the time we will take in to account that if there are back-to-back -back sessions, you will, well, as an athlete, they should see transition, the words transition and eat a banana or a wrap or a piece of fruit or something in between to at least give you something to, but you've got to be organized, as Alan said, like, you know, you have your, have your Tupperware container with your wrap in it, your couple of boiled eggs, your fruit, um, whatever it is, maybe it is a small portion of overnight oats, even in between that you can get in. Um, and you know you can cope with that based on what the next session is and what the intensity is. So, you know, just being planned and probably goes back to Elizabeth's question about, you know, whether you're a beginner or you're an elite athlete, does it just fuel them work for you? Yes, it probably just comes down to your degree of planning and how much what your training program is that's going to require the amount of effort that you have to put in. Um, good question. It's uh, yeah, and I think what Chris has outlined as well is not uncommon. We do see that a lot with a lot of time-starved athletes, and I think it's you know just really think about that um, you know preparation and planning. And it's not necessary to meal prep with Tupperware and plastic Tupperware containers stacked in your fridge. It's more just do you have those readily available um, food items and sort of ingredients and things like that at you know, at your fingertips when you need them. Yeah. All right. So we have one question from Les in the chat. It says, I sometimes hit the low end of macros during various meals and snacks. When those minor gaps add up to the point of needing to make it up at dinner and shortly after, what are the guidelines? Do I make up the protein, but maybe not the fat? What about concerns with carb timing late in the day? Les, I probably should have just let you ask your question, but it was great. <laughs> I mean, I, from my point of view, Les, you just try and hit your hit your the targets that we've set out. Like, certainly get your protein in. Don't let that fall short. Get your fat in. I mean, it's total calories and total energy in the end of the day, and you you got to be trying to get that in because we we're recommending a set amount that yes should be partitioned across the day for various reasons. But ultimately, you know, again, if you look at some of the studies around timing and that, you know, the total intake probably is the really important thing certainly protein total intake is going to be the important factor here timing of carbohydrates in the evening i mean again like I, I wouldn't read into it too much i think if you need the carbs have the carbs and you know even we've highlighted this if taking in a high glycemic index carb before bed can actually improve sleep quality and sleep duration so don't be afraid of that i think people more get afraid of this like carb backloading or eating carbs late at night is going to make you fat. And it's just, I think as Alan highlighted, you can't argue with uh, physics and physiology. And, you know, if, if you're not in a, a massive surplus, then I wouldn't worry about it. And I think the last thing you have to worry about is putting on body fat. Um, I think you're in, you're in pretty good shape, mate. So I don't think there's any issues there. And I think one of the things that we have, historically there's been that mentality and I, I'll call it for lack of a better word, the my fitness power mentality is if people come in under their total calorie intake, they kind of see that as a bonus. Like, yay, I came in under kind of thing, almost like that that's the goal. And, um, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, we might've thought, oh yeah, that's probably not a bad idea, but we now know, you know, the risk that happens if you're under fuel, like just total calories is, is inadequate over a long period of time, the health and performance implications of that. Um, and obviously the app is designed to guide you to what, you know, what amount of calories is appropriate for your goals. But yeah, I mean, that's the appropriate amount. So we don't want to deliberately undercut that because just because we can. Yeah, I, I, that's so important to not undercut, like, yes, be aware of over, maybe going over, especially if you've got a goal of improving body composition, losing body fat, but certainly don't go under purposely. I think that's. You know, it's obviously a reach out to us so if you've got issues or you think you're being overfed, but more often than not, that's not the case. So, um, yeah, there is that temptation to go under and think it's advantageous, but it, it's certainly not. And I think, too, just for ease, less I would suggest, like, I've, we all kind of eat consistently a lot of the same things. And so you might, like, oh, yeah, I, you know, the end of this day, I'm usually... 20 ish grams of protein short and a cup. I have a couple in my mind kind of snacks at the end of the day. Like I'm like, Oh, I know this one yogurt cup with some berries mixed in 
uh, is, is about, you know, 20 grams of protein, 25 grams of carbs. And it's like, it just makes it easier if I have a couple like in the chamber that I know, oh yeah, at the end of the day, I'm 20 grams of protein short. I can quick grab this or I can quick grab that. And it just kind of takes some of that decision fatigue out or worrying, like, how am I going to meet these at the end? So whether it's like a two hard boiled eggs with, you know, something or a yogurt or a protein shake that, you know, you can make um, to pull in at the end of the day, that's really easy. I think that'll make it, um, yeah, just manageable. Fruit, fruit's always a good option as well, Les, at the end of the night. I think so many people are low on fruits during the day. And if you got some carbs spare, like don't be afraid of some, you know, rock melon, mango, banana, apple, whatever it is. And it's always a nice treat. So some berries, all that sort of stuff. Um, Manny put a question. Can I use the app with an iPad and lose it on an Android device? Um, you can use the app on an iPad, although the functionality is not designed on an iPad. So I believe there are some issues with syncing with MyFitnessPal. You can't use it on an Android device at this point in time. Um, you certainly is the just question, to Sorry, I was going to say, Scott, is the question whether Lucid is being used on an Android device and then they're using fuel in on the iPad? I, no, you can't do that. I, I think, yeah, you can't sync up. Well, not. I, I did ask an athlete to try this, but I don't think you can. I'm pretty sure, yeah, you'd have to, yeah. I, I can't honestly give you an answer. I don't think so. I don't think if you're using My Fitness Power Lose It through an Android device, whether it will sync up properly with Fuel In, given that it's also on an iPad, which is less than ideal as the, the platform to use it on. So... Have you got it, Manny? Have you got fuel in on the iPad? Or are you asking like as a test? Just you can speak, Manny. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm considering getting the app, but I just, I don't use Apple products normally, except for the iPad. I'm more okay. of an Android guy. So yeah. I'm kind of cornered. How do I use your app? If I can't yeah. connect with uh, Lose It and Training Peaks. Look, what you can do, you can, if you want to sign up and if it doesn't work, just message us and we can cancel it. It's fine. It, it'd be an interesting test, actually. <laughs> I'd be quite interested. Well, I, I wouldn't mind being the guinea pig. Yeah, yeah. If you want to do that and then just, you know, if, if it doesn't all work out, just message coach at fuelin.com and just, just remind, just send a message, say, I spoke to Scott on Q&A. And it just doesn't work and we can sort you out. Outstanding. Thank you. Cool. No, that's cool. Okay. Sorry, guys. We've um we've gone over uh, as usual. But only um, four minutes. Not yeah, I know, only four minutes. Um, hopefully everyone uh, I know we got a lot of questions actually, and they all came in late, so we didn't answer all the ones we had. So we'll save them up for the next one. Uh next week's call is Alan is holding that and it is the what, why, and when for hydration. So it should be a really nice, um, I think, recap on what we've talked about previously, but also maybe some updates in uh, sort of the latest research. And obviously that's uh, Alan's area of expertise from his PhD and uh, his teachings at Monash University. So it should be a really good one. Uh, apart from that, we will say goodbye. Well done, everyone, on your uh, races and everything recently. It's been uh, very, very good seeing all the amazing results. So well done. Have a good evening, morning, afternoon, everyone. <laughs> yep. Thank, Thank you. you Thanks, Sam.